team of us, everyone in. Now you're welcome along to Wednesday Night Rugby. Joe Malloy here with you this evening. So this day has probably been coming for rugby for quite some time. I'm sure you've seen the general uh, gist of the story at this stage. A class action seems to be imminent. Eight former players currently, eight former players currently claiming the sport has left them with permanent brain damage. Every member of those eight has been diagnosed with early signs of dementia. Uh, so next week what's going to happen is that the English Union, the Welsh Union and World Rugby will be receiving a letter of claim and class action could follow. A letter of claim. The letter of claim amounts to millions in damages and lawyers for the group say they have another 80 players, 80, 80 players aged between 25 and 55 who are showing symptoms and serious concerns. And neither the uh, unions nor World Rugby are commenting on the situation just yet. The IRFU here in Dublin say they've received no contact although the solicitors involved in this class action uh, have mentioned contact at least, uh, certainly contact with 10 Irish players, but we don't know if those Irish players have uh, signed up yet. We understand they're not in the initial eight anyway. Uh, yesterday you were seen, we talked about it on the show, uh, World Cup winner in 03, Steve Thompson, uh, spoke to The Guardian, just desperate situation. I uh, can't remember any of the games in the 03 World Cup. He's been diagnosed with early onset dementia and probable CTE, 42 years of age, he says at times at home he looks at his wife and he can't remember her name. He has four young children. It's a nightmare scenario for uh, Steve Thompson. So that, that made uh, waves around the rugby world at least yesterday. Uh, CTE, as I'm sure you all know, the reason it's probable CTE that he's been diagnosed with, it's the disease discovered by Dr. Bennett O'Malley when he looked at the brain of the former NFL player Mike Webster. It was the subject of that film Concussion with Will Smith. CTE can only be diagnosed in the brain after death. So that's why Steve Thompson has been diagnosed with probable CTE. It's been found in the brains of multiple NFL players, Jeff Astell as well, who obviously we know from the footballing world. So as for the case, uh, the group must prove the governing bodies have been guilty of negligence. NFL made their settlement in 2013, close to a billion dollars. NHL, the National Hockey League, two years ago made a similar uh, settlement. Uh, one last quote before we bring in our next guest. Uh, Richard Boardman, he is the lawyer acting on behalf of these eight players. So he said, we believe up to 50, that's 5-0, we believe up to 50% of former professional rugby players could end up with neurological complications in retirement. That is an epidemic, end quote. Uh, as with any class action, the uh, smaller group are taking this initial claim. The letter will arrive next week and they'll have several months to uh, respond. The lawyers, uh, like Richard Boardman, have said this is going to take a long time. This is a, a lengthy process. Delighted to say Jamie Cudmore has made time for us. Uh, Canadian international, played for 11 years with uh, Claremont. Jamie, how are you doing? I'm good, thank you. How are you guys? Yeah, great. Uh, this day probably has been coming for rugby for some time. Yeah, I think it has. Um, you know, as, as you've Said earlier with uh, the NHL and the NFL, um, contact sports uh, are finally starting to catch up with the uh, with the data and the research that is out there around uh, around head injuries. How is your health, Jamie? I'm uh, extremely fortunate in that um, I don't think I have any major um, major problems. I've done quite a lot of uh, neurological work since uh, moving back to Canada. Uh, with some pretty groundbreaking testing and um, and had some great results. So for myself, uh, for the time being, uh, things are good. Um, but, you know, who knows what might happen in 5, 10, 15 years. Do you worry about it much? Um, no, no, I don't. I can't because it's not something that I can control. Um, I still run a, a very healthy lifestyle, you know, work out a lot, um, Try to stay as healthy as possible. You know, eat eat clean, uh, not too much uh, alcohol, and and just try to keep general you know fitness, um, so that you know I, I can continue to do do what I want to do. But um, you know, who's who's to say what might happen uh, in the in the future? As I just said, I don't know if you got a chance to read the Steve Thompson interview, but it's utterly horrific. It's an absolute nightmare. Yes, uh, I haven't read Steve's, but uh, I've been in contact with the group that's put this class action together over the last few months. So I understand the uh, where they're coming from. I understand the different tests that they've done. Um, and I know Alex Popham very well after, you know, playing against each other in Wales and in France. 
uh, and he's part of the, this uh, this lawsuit. Um, Steve being a part of it as well, and hearing uh, you know his, his timonage of him not being able to remember things, it's it's obviously uh, horrible, horrible to think that uh, you know having such a great career, um, only you know five to ten years after guys being in in such bad state uh, mentally and physically is uh, is really heartbreaking to hear. I presume they were looking f uh, to you for some advice on your own experiences, uh, legal and otherwise. What what did you say to them? Um, so I basically just gave them the uh, the rundown of what's happened in my case, and um, as it's still ongoing in France uh, due to COVID, obviously everything's been uh, slowed down uh, dramatically. Um, and we just basically compared notes. Uh, the two lawyers spoke about you know maybe getting uh, some uh, of the ex or current French professionals in, involved in this in this case, um, because um, you know if you if you look at the data of what the IRB and now World Rugby have done from the 70s up until now, um, there was a real drastic change in mindset, you know, kind of in the, the late late 90s, basically on the onset of professionalism when, uh, you know, the, uh, the old three week stand down, which used to be normal, uh, has now all of a sudden gotten into uh, a six day turnaround, which is, you know, as, as we all know, very, very convenient for professional clubs. So you're unconvinced by that six day stand down? Oh, not at all, not at all. Um, you know, in certain cases, it's enough time because people recover at different, uh, at different speeds. Um, but, um, you know, I don't, I don't think it's, um, uh, with the data out there, I don't think it's, uh, responsible to, uh, put somebody back on the field six days after having a concussion and, you know, small, medium or large, Concussion is a concussion. Yeah. Um, you have brain injury, so it needs to be treated extremely seriously. I'll get your uh, take on the current protocols and the future for the game in a moment, but just to remind people, and we don't have to dwell on it or spend too long on it, but just to remind people of your own story, because the last I saw was that earlier this year, a court-appointed neurologist uh, ruled that Claremont were responsible for the harm you suffered after uh, you played on with the concussion in the 2015 a Champions Cup and I wasn't sure where the case was post that so it's still ongoing is this still going to have to go to court a judge presumably decides uh, damages or, or, or even guilt in the first place is that where you are yes so um, how it works in the French legal system is that they do an expertise the expertise has uh, normally takes three months uh, ours took or mine took 11 um, as it was such a complex case um, so it's gone now from that expertise, which we won, and uh, the judge found the club at fault, uh, to now uh, turning into a civil case, um, and uh, and we're going through the uh, the uh, the different stages of that civil case here now. Um, you know, as as you said, back in 2015, semifinal of the Champions Cup, I was taken off the field for an HIA. Um, and at that point, I think, so, wasn't it you and uh, Billy Vunapola, who we're all very familiar with, obviously he's not a small man, uh, you, you clashed heads quite badly at the bottom of a ruck. Yeah, basically we, we came flying into a ruck from uh, our opposing sides at, at literally the same time. It was like two rams butting heads. Um, we both kind of sat there on all fours uh, for about you know, 10, 20 seconds, try to get ourselves together. And he kind of ran off and I went to get back in the defensive line. and. At the same time, I, uh, my physio grabbed me and took me off for, for the HIA. Um, I was deemed uh, unfit to continue to play, but then was still asked to come back on five minutes later. Um, so I went in the change room, did the HIA, got stitched up, was told my day was done. Um, and then five minutes later, was asked by the doctor to come back on the field as my, uh, my second row partner had got injured, finished that game. Um, 15 days later, we were, we won the game against Saracens. We were in the final uh, against uh, against Toulon, and um, yeah, unfortunately, the first tackle I made of that game, I was uh, sparked out again. Went through another HIA, kept playing, had another uh, head knock in the about 67th minute where uh, I was cut, taken off the field, got stitched up, started puking in the uh, in the change room while I was getting stitched up, um, and you know wanted to get back on off out on the field, doctor let me go out there again. Um, and then that kind of started at least, you know, a good month of some serious, serious symptoms, you know, not being able to sleep, being extremely uh, sensitive to light and noise. Mm. Um, and, you know, understanding, 
you know what had actually happened realizing that you know the the club almost almost killed me um mm -hmm. during those two those two weeks all to try to get to winning winning a game um and it was uh it was it was really disappointing that a club that i you know put my body on the line for 11 years to uh basically uh put me out to dry like that uh it was um it was too bad so um mm. oh, we don't want to see that happening at uh at, at youth level uh, as you know kids are watching us on the weekends so hence why my wife and i started a foundation around youth education uh, around concussion and um we uh we've taken the club to uh to court to basically just put a line in the sand so that hopefully this uh doesn't keep uh keep happening mm. In the final, when you were taken off after that initial done, did you pass that HIA when you went out then? The original HIA I, I did pass, yes. Um, but then you turned out you were vomit, vomiting in the dressing room not so long afterwards. Yeah, in the second half. So, um, you know, it's uh, normally that's a pretty uh, telltale sign or symptom of, uh, of having a serious, uh, yeah. serious head injury. And had, but, you, um, had, had you received another significant blow or blow to the head after passing the HIA when you were back on the pitch? Yeah, so I okay. that was the the second one when I had the head knock, which which is where I got cut open at the sixty seventh minute of okay. the second half. Okay, okay, okay. And between semi final and failing HIA after your clash with uh, Billy, Billy Vunapola and then going back out on to the pitch and playing again, how were you between semi final and final? Like, was there a rigorous return to play protocol in place then in twenty fifteen? Yeah, so we did, we still had the six day uh, return to play protocol in in place. Okay. Um, as we had two weeks before the uh, final, um, I did a graduated return to play. So my return to play was 10 days. Um, I was uh, well taken care of by the, uh, the neurologist in, in Clermont and, uh, and, the, and the team doctors. Um, but it was kind of, everybody was pushing uh, for me to get, the, to get the green light. I was too. Um, you know, as a, as, a, as a competitor at that level or at any level, rugby player, you, you want to be on the field, you want to be able to help your boys uh, get the victory. Um, and, you know, I was pushing to, to get fit, the doctors were pushing to get fit, and it was kind of the perfect storm to get me back out on the field. Never really realizing that I hadn't quite recovered yet because I was, um, you know, with the, with the first tackle that I made in the game, and I hadn't done much contact in the weeks leading up. It was more just, uh, you know, run-throughs, line-outs, and uh, just, you know, preparing for a final, keeping our legs fresh, um, and, uh, you know, getting into, into the contact, they realized that clearly I hadn't, uh, hadn't yet recovered. Mm. No, clearly not. And were you feeling symptoms and hiding symptoms in that two weeks up to the final? Um, on, uh, on reflection, I think I was. Um, I think I wanted to be involved so badly um, and, uh, you know, wanted to, you know, after, especially after our loss in 2013, um, you know, I wanted to be a part of, uh, you know, us finally winning it. Um, you know, like I said, the doctors were doing everything to give me the green light and I was doing the same. So, uh, like I said, it was a perfect storm of, uh, of just trying to get out there. But, um, you know, definitely on reflection, I... I, uh, I didn't have that excitement, that bubbling, you know, before the game. I mm. remember going out in the in the Saturday morning where we did a little walkthrough in the park next to the hotel, and I just couldn't I couldn't get excited. And I I remember on re in reflection that that was a really strange feeling for me, uh, just not being able to get up and you know being fired up for a game, which for me is one of the biggest games I've ever played in. It's extraordinary that you vomited in the dressing room and returned to the pitch. Yeah, yeah, it is. That's um, that's kind of one of the biggest, you know, parts of this whole uh, this whole scenario that um, you know that shocked the, me the most on, on reflection. Shocked my my family, my my friends, even um, you know a teammate of mine, Benson Stanley, was standing right there and he watched me do it. And um, you know he's had a lot of head injuries uh, as well, um, and even he was shocked. Um, you know, so he's shocked, the, the kit man's shocked, and the doctor's there thinking, oh, yeah, no, you should be okay. Yeah, you, you look like you're good. It's probably just stress. Go on, go, go keep playing. Whereas stress, I've never, I've never puked in a rugby game my whole life. Mm. Did the doctors literally say it's probably just stress to you? No, that's what he said in, uh, in retrospect uh, afterwards. He said, uh, no, normally I've seen that a lot in, in athletes with, uh, in high-stress situations mm. that they... Uh, 
sometimes become a bit nauseous. Maybe before kickoff, not after the match is underway and they're in the thick of it. So these, the, the, and the context here is semi-final. You have failed the HIA after your clash with Vunapola. You've been put back out onto the pitch, and now you've taken another knock in the final two weeks later, and you've had to have another HIA which you've passed, and now you've taken another knock to the head, and you're being stitched up, and then you vomit in the dressing room being stitched up, and you're put out onto the pitch again. That's what that's that's the gist here, is it? That's exactly right. Okay. I should say Claremont Verne have denied any wrongdoing whatsoever, and the uh, case obviously is still um, ongoing. So, I, I mean, I, I, you've probably thought about this a lot more than I have. You can educate us a little bit here. Uh, like, rugby is in a, in a tricky spot. So take from even, you know, a lot of your career. Professionalism really ramps up from, say, you know, that, the 2000s in a big way. Uh, players getting bigger, they're full-time professionals. They are, it would seem, anecdotally, based on what a bunch of players have said, doing a lot of contact work and training. And, yeah. you know, rugby league coaches are coming into the game as defensive coaches. And, you know, it's, we're hearing the word, you know, hits as opposed to tackles and head-high tackles. And, and everything ramps up. And, you know, somewhere over in, in the States, Dr. Bennett O'Malley was discovering CTE and the science is trying to catch up on where we are in, in concussion. So, so rugby, in, you know, in that decade that you played, you know, right through until 2015 uh, territory, that's, it would seem uh, to be the decade at the moment, which is uh, where these eight players with the initial class action are coming from uh, in yeah. the main. So, so, so what was going on in that period? Well, in that period on, on, on my side, say the player's side, uh, like you said, people, guys were trying to get bigger, fat, faster, stronger. Um, you know, rugby had only really been professional for, you know, five, five six years. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, it was, uh, it was exploding. It was exploding in France. Like, you know, we started playing in Stade de France for, um, you know, uh, club games, 75,000 people. Like, things were blowing up. Um, so I think professionalism was trying to get, you know, get the stars on the field, get uh, everybody playing a, a faster, more exciting brand of rugby, which is easier to sell, obviously. And, um, you know, unfortunately, the, um, the health and safety of the, of the players was, was pushed way down the priority list. Mm. Um, you know, you look at the, the first, I think the first three years I was in France, I played you know, almost 40, 42, 43 games a year. Uh, between internationals, uh, clubs, games, uh, warm-up games, and, and European Cup. So, um, you know, you couple the, the fact that guys are playing too many games and the fact that um, the, uh, the player welfare is not keeping up with the data that's out there um, is, uh, is a pretty bad mix. Because I was rereading some interviews with Dr. Barry O'Driscoll. He was the medical chief with World Rugby, and he resigned in 2012, you know, and he recalled a conference in Zurich in 2004 where the issues around concussion were really being discussed and protocols were beginning to be brought in officially and he even resigned in 2012 because he was unhappy with the five minute HIA test I think it was a pitch side concussion test or whatever the name of it was back then but you know he was saying five minutes and but even you know he would he is on the record of saying five ten fifteen minutes you can't rule out concussion and, and that's, you know, what the test is almost uh, claiming to do. And that's the inherent problem here with concussive episodes. Like there's a, a, a quote from World Rugby in uh, 2015, which Barry O'Driscoll uh, talked about in the uh, Sunday Independent. He was talking to Paul Kimmage. And so in 2015, uh, George North clashed heads with his own teammate, Richard Hibbert. And he should have been taken off, it seems, and he wasn't. So World Rugby released a statement, you know, and this is 2015. This is kind of where the, the game is to try and grapple with this situation. Uh, the World Rugby head injury protocol, they said, on the back of this controversy, it clearly states that a player should be immediately and permanently removed from the field of play where there are any visible symptoms or, and here's the key line, or suspicion of a potential concussion. Suspicion of a potential concussion. I mean, the whole reason you're doing the test is there is a suspicion of a potential concussion. So World Rugby are saying here, you should leave the field for good when that happens. Um, therefore, nobody should really pass a HIA. You know, by their, by their own logic here, I mean, who knows how this plays out in court, but even that statement alone, they say the player should leave immediately and permanently if there is a suspicion of a potential concussion. This is 2015. 
So like, how does anyone pass HIA and come back onto the field has to be a question. You're exactly right. You, they've, they've contradicted themselves again and again. And I know Dr. O'Driscoll is actually a colleague of my father's. Um, and, you know, hats off to him for taking a stand and resigning uh, for, you know, World Rugby to, to, to try and change things like this. They're taking, um, they're taking uh, the lead from uh, the CSIG, the Concussion in Sport Group, which is, it's a, it's a, it's a group that's just going to give them exactly what they want. It's not a, a medical group that's actually going to give them proper data as to how to properly, um, how to properly protect players or protect people that get injured. Uh, at the end of the day, it's, it's professional sports. You know, the, the, the athletes are the, are the, are the cows. If they, if they don't work, well, we'll just get a couple more guys in. And who is that group, sorry, they're relying on? Because I just, legally, I'm not too sure um, who they are. I haven't heard of them. And obviously, I'm sure they'd argue they are giving proper data. Who, who is that group you referenced? That's a concussion in sport group. So that's a, a, a research group that um, helps uh, the IRB uh, back, back in, the, in the early early 2000s and then up into uh, up into late 2010, 2011, where they, uh, they basically um, advise um, uh, world rugby around, uh, around head injury uh, protocols. Okay. I mean, I, I do get the sense as well, um, and for obvious reasons, uh, world rugby have been trying to sort this out, you know, because I mean, they're as concerned as anybody. I don't think anybody wants to see player welfare um, be in a bad place. The, the, the problem, I, 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 like, what do you do to to stop knocks to heads happening in rugby? They've trialled lowering the tackle rate or the tackle height, uh, Jamie, and I think that proved even counterproductive in some of the tests. Uh, for, you know, bizarrely, counterintuitively, but lowering the tackle height actually was counterproductive when it came to he came to head injuries. Like, so, how across a, however many game season across a 10, 15 year career do you stop knocks to a head on the rugby field? Well, you're never you're never going to stop knocks to the rug uh, to the head in a rugby field. Rugby's a contact sport, and I don't in in in, in my thinking I don't want to change inherently the sport. I think there's some small adjustments that can be made so we can keep playing rugby as as we know and love it. Um, but the biggest thing for me, and hence why my wife and I started uh, our, our foundation, was education at the grassroots level. When you understand the dangers around concussion. Um, as a player or as a teammate or as an organizer or as a parent or referee or whatever it may be, um, you can do a lot more in helping people when they get injured. Um, when you break, when somebody breaks their leg, they don't go back on the rugby field and keep trying to go, keep trying to play. Well, it's the same thing with a concussion. If you suspect somebody having a concussion, you say, okay, well, you're clearly injured here. You need to come off the field and you need to be, uh, um, evaluated yeah. and understand where the problem is. So for me, the biggest thing is just more education at the grassroots level so that people understand the dangers moving forward. It's something that's been done over the last 10, 15 years in, here in Canada with the NHL. Uh, people are much more aware of, of the problem and they treat it very, very seriously. Yeah. Um, and I don't think rugby's done that well enough over the last 10, 15 years. Okay, because to my eye at the moment, and it's not based on data, but just to my eye, it looks like HIIAs do happen and with great uh, frequency and, you know, seem to be working, relatively speaking, about as well as they can be, you know, for what they are. They are an imperfect solution, obviously. I mean, not least based on that 2015 uh, World Rugby statement. And, and we all acknowledge concussive symptoms can kick in the next morning, you know, so they are an imperfect solution. But I, I do see the HIAs being taken seriously in the games I watch anyway. Are you not seeing that? Um, I, well, I think they are, but it goes back to the, the statement earlier where, you know, there's a suspected concussion. So, you know, it's, 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 yeah. it's they're, they're, they're not following the, the, the laws of the game. Um, I know this is only in the professional entity because the, the HIA is not used anywhere else. Um, but the dangerous thing is, you know, the kids are watching on the weekend, you know, they're going to start asking for an HIA when they're playing under 12s and under 14s. And uh, that's, that's extremely dangerous. Yeah. So the other, I mean, the other aspect as well is we, we talk about concussion as if that's the only danger here, you know, and, and Boston University, when they were discussing CTE, made the point that 20% of athletes who were showing early stages of uh, progressive brain illnesses were examined post-mortem 
and they never even had a diagnosed concussion. 20% and they hadn't have had a diagnosed concussion. So there is, and even that film Concussion with Will Smith explains it very simply with a simple analogy of, uh, you know, something in a jar, you shake it around a bit. Like there is the whiplash effect, there are just elbows to the head, you know, bouncing off a fella's hip with the head may, may not necessarily be a concussion, but like that kind of punishment over a long period, that's got to be a concern as well, no? Oh, definitely, definitely. And, um, you know, you can you can slip over in the shower and knock your head. You can fall off your bike and get a concussion. You know, there's so many different ways to actually, you know, get this. <clears throat> but the, the important thing when we're talking about rugby, is, as I said before, if we can get the education level up, People can um, react and, and deal with these injuries a lot better when they do happen, as opposed to the, the, the old days where, you, oh, you just rub a bit of dirt on it and get, it, get on out there. Well, clearly don't do that anymore because the, the data has evolved. Hmm. Is there, but like we sort of said, there's no way of avoiding that rough and tumble. You know, that is the cut and thrust of the game. Those kind of, uh, not traumatic knocks to the head, but just bangs here, bang there, and maybe, you know, not massively noticeable, a few whiplash kind of motions. Um, I, what, what does the game do about them? Oh, you, you, you can't do much about that. You know, yeah. that's... That's, so that, that, that's, our, that's our problem here, isn't it? Going forward. No, that's, not, that's not the problem. I think, I think we, can't, we can't put a blanket on or wrap everybody in cotton wool. Sure. But I think, you know, we can be, um, we can be proactive around it in teaching better tackle technique. We can look at, uh, you know, neck strengthening exercise for kids, making sure everybody's wearing mouth guards when they play. Um, you know, simple things like that can go a long way to reducing, um, but you're never going to get rid of it. That's that's impossible. It's a contact sport. Mm. Jeez, you even get concussions in soccer or mm. basketball. Mm. And, you know, basketball is a non-contact sport. So, you know, it still happens, um, but it needs to be dealt with properly when it does, and uh, we can't just brush it under, you know, saying that he's a, he's a big kid or he's a big girl or mm. whatever, or, or a tough kid, um, you know, keep going. Um, you know, because at the professional level, it, we need to do better because it ultimately, who's watching us day in, day out? It's, it's, it's the kids around the, around the country, and uh, if we don't show the right way to do it, well, I, I think we're doing a disservice. Okay, so it, it sounds like you think the game absolutely has a very big and positive future then going forward if it can improve those oh, those things you've mentioned. Yeah, definitely. I don't want to be doom and gloom, and I'm not a conspiracy theorist or anything like that. I want the game to continue to grow and you know evolve, um, and I think we can evolve a little bit quicker around the uh, player welfare side of things because the data is out there, and uh, we just need to you know, judge that as best we can and then evolve the game uh, so that it continue to be the game that we love. It's exciting, fun, you know, a bit of rough and tumble, but, um, you know, ultimately a, a great, one of my opinion, one of the greatest team games in the world. Mm. So short term, things that aren't happening at the elite level that need to happen, you know, yesterday. Give, it, give us some of those points again you mentioned that should be happening straight away. Well, at the elite level, I think you know in in France over the last few years they've uh, they've uh, l largened the, um, the the bench with more players. That can go either way, mm. you know. You bring in fresh new uh, 130 kilo guys uh, for the last 20 minutes of the game. You know that's that's difficult. Mm. But at the same time, it also uh, takes off the pressure on keeping people that are injured on the field. Um, so there's a bit of a double edged sword there. Um, you know, I think if we just keep working on the education side of things and World Rugby needs to do a lot more on, on the education uh, piece uh, because, you know, from my, from my own experiences in France over the last 20 years, the only thing I ever heard from the FFR or World Rugby was either don't take drugs when you're playing rugby, which is a given, mm. and then two, you can't gamble on the game. Mm. Well, to me, that's... I, who, who the hell cares about gambling? I don't gamble, so I'm sure some people do, but I, I think uh, concussion education is a hell of a lot more important than uh, worrying about people gambling. Mm. And where are you on the future of the HIA and how the game handles uh, suspected concussions? Well, I think we should uh, follow the letter of the law. The letter of the law says if there's a suspected concussion, you take the player off. I'm a coach uh, here in Canada. If any of my players have any suspected concussion they're they're straight off the field and they they're in the doctor's hands they're no longer in my hands and if they pass um, the hia 
if they pass an HIA, as as we are not a professional entity, we we don't use HIAs. Um, but when I'm uh, with the national team, yes, we we uh, used HIAs, but we'll pref we prefer to put a um, fresh player on as opposed to putting out a, a player that's uh, gone through an HIA to continue the game. Okay, even if they've passed, so you don't put you don't put a player back on if they've passed a HIA. No, we don't. Okay, okay. So this case with Claremont then. Is this going to wrap up anytime soon? Because uh, I don't know much about legal cases. I know they're stressful as hell. They're stressful, they're expensive, and they're long. Um, so, and you add COVID in there, and it's uh, you can just lengthen that by another six months to a year. So, um, you know, I'm waiting hopefully on something over the next couple of weeks or maybe January, February. Mm. I, I, to ask an obvious question, uh, your relationship with the club and everybody that you knew there just uh, must have uh, blown up and, and disintegrated into a billion pieces when you decided to take this action. Was that difficult? I mean, people who I suspect you thought were great friends and great colleagues, those relationships must have been sacrificed. Um, the, the, the friends that I had that I'd, that I'd uh, built and, and held on to over the, the 11 years at Clermont are, are still there. Um, the people that uh, I, I knew were going to side with the club, you know, I knew they were going to side with the club, and that's disappointing. Um, but um, you know, I was very fortunate to uh, to have a, a great core group of guys that uh, continually uh, we keep we're still in contact, we're still talking, and uh, we still um, you know we we still talk about you know the good old days and and then what's happening now in the future. Um, but, uh, you know, I think a lot of people got very emotional around the, uh, the whole issue. And uh, as you know, when emotion uh, comes into any issue, it, uh, it gets blown out of proportion. So, um, mm. you know, there's been some, uh, some difficult days, um, not so much for me, but, you know, for my family and for uh, other people that are involved in it. Um, but, um, you know, for me, I'm very, very happy as to, you know, how my career went there. And just unfortunately over those last two weeks that uh, things kind of went south. Okay. Well, listen, Jamie Cudmore, we very much appreciate your time uh, this evening. I know it's a bit earlier where you are, but thanks so much. No problem. Thank you, gentlemen. Bye-bye. Thank you. That's uh, Jamie Cudmore there, former uh, Canadian international and played with Claremont. Uh, just a point to make on the concussion in sport group that Jamie mentioned. Uh, so they're a group of 30, 40 experts. They gather to review the latest research, they say. Uh, they summarise those findings. They produce a document. FIFA use them, as well as World Rugby, I should say that. And uh, they themselves talk about the importance of an evidence-based approach. And they talk about very much uh, using raw data and medical science. And uh, we you know, fully suspect that's what they do. Obviously, James is entitled to his opinion as well. But we'll take a short ad break. I'll update you on Champions League. Wednesday Night Rugby on Off The Ball. With Vodafone, official sponsors of the Irish rugby team. Team of us. Everyone in. News Talk Breakfast. Foreign holidays by the